uh, stabilize. So I'll, I'll start talking. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Galen Barbos. I'm with Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, where we'll be talking about uh, sort of the, the theory and the practice uh, for how solar PV systems that are installed on non-residential buildings like churches and schools uh, can help to seed residential solar adoption within the surrounding community. Um, we've got a, a great lineup of speakers who I will introduce momentarily. Uh, first, though, just a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will post that recording along with a copy of the webinar slides up on the web, uh, and we'll send out an email to everybody who registered within the next uh, day or two, just letting you know where, where you can find that. Um, and then secondly, we plan to have some time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, so hopefully you can all see the Q&A uh, chat box within your webinar console. Uh, so I would just encourage you as, as we go through the material, uh, please enter in questions. We're, we're gonna hold them for the end, but it's great if we have them queued up and can kind of get ourselves organized in advance. So uh, please do enter in questions as we go. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so the plan for the webinar here, uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, a number of different folks who are going to speak. Uh, we're going to start with Issa Farrell Wolf. Uh, Issa is an energy equity researcher uh, in the Accelerated Deployment and Decision Support Center at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And she'll, today she'll be providing some of the, the context behind the work that we'll be sharing today, uh, specifically related to the Solar Energy Innovation Network, which is the, the, the program or the initiative within which uh, much of this work uh, occurred. Uh, we'll next be hearing from Eric O'Shaughnessy. Eric is an affiliate here at Berkeley Lab, where he leads up a lot of our work on solar market dynamics. Um, and he'll be presenting the results from a recently published paper of ours that analyzes the role of social influence between non-residential and residential solar adopters. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Andreas Karelis, the founder and executive director of Revolve, uh, who will discuss their experiences and, and observations uh, and how this, this social influence uh, can play out in practice. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we'll have a good maybe 15 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Isa. Wonderful. Thanks, Galen. Um, so as he mentioned, um, uh, I'm at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. Uh, and I, this is such a great research collaboration that merges academia and uh, our community uh, based research, um, specifically through the Solar Energy Innovation Network that sponsored this research. SIGN helps communities develop transformative approaches to adopting solar energy. And in the third round of SIGN, underserved communities explored new approaches to the equitable adoption of solar in residential, in the yellow, and commercial scale settings in the orangish red. Um, one of round three's multi-stakeholder teams um, worked nationwide, uh, so it doesn't have one specific pin, um, but the project was titled Bringing Solar to Houses of Worship, led by Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So uh, we are very excited to partner with Revolve, leading this partnership alongside Green the Church and Interfaith Power and Light. The research that you'll hear about today uh, led by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, attempted to validate one of the team's theory of changes. So namely that installing uh, uh, solar on a commercial scale building can seed or influence local residential solar adoption. So to keep up with this and other signed publications, uh, please visit our website. We'll put it in the Q&A um, and sign up for our listserv. Uh, I've We've already put the publication link uh, in the Q&A chat for you to see, but um, yeah, we'll dive right in to the research. Great. Thank you, Isa. Uh, so now uh, this is kind of, as Galen set it up, we have the theory and the practice. My chunk will be 
research. So lots of numbers, analysis, uh, and lots of qualified statements about this. Then later on, we're going to pivot to Andreas, who's really out there in the field and can give some, make this all more practical. So maybe uh, bear with me in the, the, nerdier, the nerdier aspects for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so this is a published paper of the same title that's shown here. So anything that I, I breeze through here, uh, it's partly because there's a lot more detail in the paper itself, and you can find it uh, by looking up this title. And I'm speaking today on behalf of all co-authors here, uh, three of course with us, um, Alexandra, uh, we were fortunate to have her as an intern before uh, she moved down the hill from the Brick Lab to study at the University of California, and Deborah Sunter is at Tufts University. Flash a disclaimer in front of everyone. Uh, so just, I'd like to have a summary up front. The context for this is that demand for emerging technologies can be influenced by the decisions of others. Uh, and a very easy way to think about this is that adoption can be, can, can be contagious. Uh, that's the headline grabbing uh, way that people describe solar, rooftop solar can be contagious. Typically we talk about that between households and for a variety of reasons, we became curious about whether residential adoption decisions can be influenced by systems installed on non-residential buildings. Uh, we'll get into a bit exactly how we did that, but just to summarize the key findings, yes, we find rather persuasive evidence um, that systems installed on non-residential buildings can influence, i.e. increase residential adoptions. Uh, we look specifically at commercial buildings, government buildings, schools, and houses of worship, and find evidence of influence across all those building types. Uh, we also find that this influence is this continuous long-term process. I'll get into the, the details of that later on. And then I'll close with this idea, the implications of this being that uh, non-residential solar adoptions could serve as a seed for residential solar adoption, and talk about that before we pivot to the next speaker. So beginning with some background, uh, there's this big question about what drives rooftop solar. Uh, you know, obviously we, we want a lot to, want to deploy a lot more rooftop solar, but rooftop is this interesting segment because it's based on millions of idiosyncratic decisions. So we really want to know what explains adoption decisions. A lot of that research focuses on personal incentives, but really starting about 10 years ago, a lot of research became interesting on the role of social influence. Um, so as I said, that's when maybe one household sees a panel installed in their household and decides to adopt influence. Uh, that's been mostly studied between households, uh, but we became curious, well, maybe there's some role for non-residential influence, but the, the same idea. So a system installed either on a rooftop or ground mounted at a non-residential building uh, could affect the adoption decisions of residential households. And to Keep up with the background here. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas wrapped up in this term influence. Uh, we can boil them down into two really big categories. Passive influence is when there's no active interaction between the adopter and the future adopter. The classic example of this is maybe someone is just see solar panels and then the, you know, the thought bubble comes up and they say, I'm gonna call an installer and install solar. There's lots of evidence that just seeing panels is enough. Um, and so for that reason, you'd expect there to be non-residential influence. As this image shows here, uh, lots of non-residential buildings have these big rooftops. This is a church, really big uh, rooftops, very salient systems, high visibility, potentially very influential. The second type is active. So this is when there's some active interaction, a, a conversation between a previous and future adopter. And this is a shorthand here, I put the idea would be interactions with customers, constituents, and congregations, meaning a business. You might walk into a business with rooftop solar panels, strike up a conversation with the owner uh, to discuss how it was, and, and maybe that could influence. And we're really specifically interested in congregations. So these are houses of worship. Lots of literature showing that houses of worship can change the behavior of their congregations. So maybe there's some idea there that a house of worship that adopts solar could change the attitudes of solar adoption in their congregation. So the research questions, uh, do non-residential solar installations influence adoption decisions? 
the hypothesis being that they make it more likely that households will adopt. And how does that influence compare to the influence between households? Those are kind of the, the two big questions we'll ask. Uh, we, we have some, we had to pull together a bunch of data for this study uh, and from non-residential and residential systems. The non-residential system data comes from our tracking the sun data set. Don't have time to get into the details, but uh, tracking the sun, there's a publicly available version. It's a really great resource. Uh, this helps us identify just any non-residential system. That's something like 40,000 systems installed from 2010 to 2021. And then we have these categories of commercial buildings, you know, 24,000 government buildings, 4,000 and schools, roughly 2,000. And like I said, we we're really interested in houses of worship specifically. So we pulled some extra data, um, thanks to Interfaith Power and Light. We pulled some data from the Department of Homeland Security. And with that, we we're able to identify roughly 1,300 houses of worship. And these sample sizes matter. Uh, in general, in statistics, we really like big sample sizes. So uh, the bigger, the better. And I'll get into some of the implications that there's, especially with schools and houses of worship, they're not, we don't have lots of systems installed that has some implications for the analysis that I'll, I'll get into later. Um, and then we have residential system data uh, from this company, BuildZoom. Uh, we don't use tracking the sun primarily because we're interested in specific dates that we get from BuildZoom. And that's something like 1.5 million, you know, roughly half of all systems that were installed uh, from 2010 to 2021. All right, so as I said, there's a, a ton of details in the paper, and I, I will admit this paper is particularly methodologically dense uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, there's a way, an established way to measure social influence and in rooftop solar adoption. It didn't work in the case of non-residential so we had to come up with a new way, and for that reason, it's it, it gets a bit uh, complex. But the very basics, the idea here is that we're we're in your in our heads. Uh, we want to model roughly the time that a non resident non residential system is installed, and then see if there's a statistical association with a residential ad adoption decision. The catch is we clearly do not observe residential adoption decisions. We have no data on the date when someone wakes up and decides, you know, today is the day I'm calling an installer, I'm adopting. Uh, but we have pretty decent ways of, of proxying those dates using the data we have, but still in just holding your mind, that's essentially what we're doing is measuring an association between the time that a non-residential system is installed and the time that a household decides to adopt. A bit more in the weeds, really just the two key points. Uh, we use this thing called a staggered differences and differences model. And the, kind of the, the core idea here is that you have a treatment and a control group. In this case, we're looking at zip codes. The treatment group are the zip codes that had a non-residential system installed. The control group are those zip codes that did not have any non-residential systems. So it gets a bit complicated, but at its core, what we're doing is measuring differences in residential adoption rates between zip codes with non-residential systems and zip codes without. And those differences under a handful of assumptions and through some econometric modeling provide evidence of the influence of non-resident residential systems. So I'm gonna cruise through some results. Uh, the, the numbers here, the interpretation of the numbers, again, is a bit complicated. Uh, so don't get too hung up on that. Roughly here, you can think of these numbers as the number of additional residential systems that are associated with a non-residential installation uh, per quarter. So you see the ranges here, we're talking something like three to four typically additional residential adoptions when looking at all the non-residential systems. Uh, these different colors and these ranges, these all represent different model specifications. So as I said, we, we did something new in this paper. So for that reason, we wanted to be really, really certain that we're, we're getting it right. 
So we provided a, a bunch of different scenarios and different samples uh, that I'm not going to have time to get into the details here, but all to say that still these ranges are, are you know, pretty wide, um, but they're all well above zero. Uh, they're all statistically significant, suggesting that non-residential systems are associated with a significant increase in residential adoptions. As you move to the right, uh, as I mentioned, the schools and houses of worship, those are much smaller sample sizes. Uh, so in the paper, we get into a bit, if you kind of control for that sample size, uh, the difference doesn't look as significant. Uh, so overall, it, it does appear that all non-residential systems have this adoption influence, uh, but the numeric outcome is a bit distorted by these differences in sample sizes. And one interesting thing, uh, a difference from our paper from previous peer or social influence studies is that we're able to see this effect over time. So again, the, the numbers here are a bit complicated, but basically uh, the line here represents the difference between the treatment and the control groups. So again, think about it. The red vertical line is the moment that a non-residential system is installed. So before the system's installed, they're roughly the same, it hovers around zero. After that, you see this long sustained difference between the treatment and control, suggesting that over time, this influence effect appears to grow. And this makes some sense. We hypothesize about it in the paper. Essentially, there could be some sort of cascading effect. So if a business inspires a household to adopt, that household could go on to inspire their neighbor to adopt. Uh, and that indirectly gets attributed back to the, the influence of the business. Uh, so it's this kind of interesting sustained influence to suggest that uh, this initial seed is really important. And then one final analysis we do is to try to get a rough idea of how the non-residential effects compare to the effects between households. Uh, again, I won't get into exactly how we did this, but through a variety of different analyses, we essentially conclude that they're comparable. Uh, the two are similar uh, in magnitude. So just to say that it does appear that non-residential influence, the amount that that affects adoption decisions, seems uh, roughly similar to how effective, say, a residential adoption is on a residential household's decision. So some discussion points. Uh, the results suggest that uh, maybe non-residential systems could seed rooftop PV adoptions. This is particularly relevant. Uh, there's a lot of, of discourse and policy movement now in terms of increasing PV deployment in underserved communities. So maybe you could partner with a non-residential partner, business, house of worship, install solar there as a way to prompt adoption in underserved communities. The comparability of the results suggests that there's some shared mechanisms. So again, visibility would be the obvious one. Uh, the visibility of, of panels on a non-residential building uh, could be an effective way to spur adoption. And then there's this somewhat suggestive uh, result that maybe there's some differences across different building types. So maybe certain types of non-residential buildings are more influential than others. I'm going to close my bit with some open questions, which will pivot into the next uh, presentation. So I'm going to answer them here, but we pose them. Uh, first, what are the mechanisms of this influence? What exactly is happening? Is it this passive, people are just driving by and seeing panels? Is there some active interaction uh, between you know, customers, congregations, and constituents? Um, and then if you think about, could there be certain non-residential institutions that can more effectively use this influence than others. And then the, the third question would be, how can we leverage or optimize it? Are there ways to design uh, non-residential interventions in a way uh, that maximize the role of this influence? So our colleague Andreas will get into uh, some ideas on these open questions with his presentations going on now. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, thanks everyone. Um, thanks Eric, Isa, and Galen. Um, 
uh, for having me and for doing this awesome research uh, that's so critical to all the work that we're all doing, trying to accelerate clean energy adoption. And, and of course, thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Um, my name is Andreas Corellis. I'm the founder and executive director of Revolve. And yeah, we're going to talk a little bit, as Eric mentioned, about some of the anecdotal evidence that we've seen over the years as to how we amplify the seeding effect in communities. Um, again, there's a lot of research that could be done on the specific mechanisms, but um, this is some of the things that we've observed um, over the years. Uh, so a little bit about Revolve. Uh, we are a climate justice nonprofit organization uh, based in San Francisco, started in 2011. And what we do is we help other nonprofits go solar. So um, nonprofits across the country, as many of you know, uh, have faced historical challenges to getting their solar projects financed. Uh, so we have provided financing to organizations that want to go solar. Um, and at the same time, we educate community members about the benefits of solar. And so this speaks to you know Eric's point and, and the point of the research about the difference between the passive influence of the seeding effect and that active interaction. And so to us, you know, when we started this uh, 13 years ago, the, the concept was exactly as this paper points out, uh, if we put up solar on nonprofits that uh, play a, a vital role in their community and that are visible, and we add to that this active interaction uh, where we're engaging community members and providing them with resources, um, that we can help amplify that seeding effect. So uh, so today I'm going to tell you a, a few highlights of, of some of the um, ideas and, and thoughts about how that works that we've identified. Uh, I'm also the author of a book called Climate Courage uh, that talks uh, about community-based solutions to climate change and how, when a community takes action, neighboring communities uh, follow suit. Um, and this is just a high level about the work of Revolve. Uh, we like to think of our work as having three pillars, what we call empower, invest, and educate. Uh, so our empowerment uh, work is really focused on uh, training the next generation of clean energy leaders. So we do that through our Solar Ambassador Fellowship Program, which is uh, trains college students around the country uh, how to go into their community and talk to local nonprofits and help them uh, through their solar journey. Next, we invest and we provide solar financing for nonprofits in the form of a 20 year solar lease, power purchase agreements or loans. Um, and this is a zero down financing option that allows nonprofits to start saving money on their electricity bills on day one um, so that they can put that back into their mission. Uh, and lastly, uh, we educate, we use that nonprofit solar project as an opportunity to engage the community and raise awareness about solar and, and have some more of those active interactions that can hopefully amplify the seeding effect, which we're going to be talking about uh, in the, the next few slides. Um, so really briefly, um, at a high level, uh, Revolve uh, over uh, our time has deployed about $12 million worth of solar which is about four megawatts, mostly small rooftop solar. Um, this is for 70 nonprofit organizations in 18 states. Uh, and those nonprofits are now saving $24 million on their electricity bills that they can put back into their work. And we've trained about 400 solar ambassadors uh, at 30 universities around the country. And just to give you a sense, you know, we focus exclusively on serving nonprofits and those nonprofits range from veterans groups to youth groups to affordable housing, health clinics, food banks, homeless shelters, uh, houses of worship. Um, and I think this is important because again, if we really are trying to amplify the seating effect, we need to work with lots of different groups that are going to engage with different audiences and speak their shared language. Uh, so one of uh, the initiatives uh, that we focused on, as Issa mentioned, uh, we were really honored to have received support from the Solar Energy Innovation Network um, uh, over the last two years, uh, partnering with uh, our longstanding partners, Interfaith Power and Light and Green the Church. And we launched an initiative uh, to bring solar to BIPOC-led houses of worship. And part of the reason behind that initiative was 
uh, the seeding effect and the, the theory behind it um, that that the research uh, we're talking about today points to, as well as uh, this paper that came out in 2019 uh, by Deborah Sunter, who's also a, a, an author on this paper, um, and her team that uh, found that the deployment of solar um, was that there's a, a massive disparity of where solar is deployed based on race and ethnicity, that communities of color have much less solar installed around the country. Um, and what they hypothesized in that paper was that this seeding effect uh, could actually have an even more significant impact in communities of color that have less solar um, which, which is a, a complementary finding to the paper here that we're discussing today, as as the authors point out that, and, and as Eric mentioned just now, um, you know where the seeding effect could potentially work in new markets where solar is not very common. It can also work in low income communities where solar is not very common. So, um, and and then this paper from 2019 is saying that the seeding effect can help in communities of color where it's less common. So this to us again is, is our theory of change at Revolve. Um, how can we be bringing solar to nonprofits in places where it's less common in historically excluded communities such that we can magnify and amplify solar adoption? So um, here are some of the uh, lessons or uh, concepts that we have uh, observed over the years, some of the strategies that we feel um, really help play a role in this uh, active interaction type of strategy as opposed to just the passive influence of putting solar up on the roof and hoping people adopt it. Um, so the, the sort of five uh, kind of takeaways that, that I want to share with you, um, you know, one is about communicating shared values. So when a nonprofit, a house of worship, a school goes solar, uh, these organizations uh, are value-driven organizations. And when they speak about and they tell the reasons for going solar, they're going to be using language that resonates with the people that care about their cause. Um, so that's an important piece is to communicate um, with shared values. The next is about building on trusted relationships. Um, this is pretty intuitive, right? Uh, if a new movie comes out, um, you're going to ask your friend uh, whose value you trust uh, about their opinion about movies, whether they thought it was a good movie, if they've seen it, and if they liked it, you will likely go see it as well. You know, and this is the case for everything. We, we turn to people that we trust and we ask what they think about things before we make a decision. And so we've seen this uh, time and time again, um, that when people have a trusted relationship with a nonprofit in the community, whether that's nonprofit to other nonprofit or whether that's a residence to the nonprofit, the trusted relationship is really key. Uh, of course, um, you know, what's what's probably pretty obvious is um, telling success stories about these projects. So uh, it's one thing, again, to just put solar on the roof, but it's another thing to get that story out in the news, um, getting it in the TV, uh, press uh, releases, social media, making videos, uh, doing everything that we can to let get the story out there and get people talking about it. The next, of course, is engaging the community directly, um, particularly in historically excluded communities. Folks might not have a sense of where can I go to to find out about solar? Where are there solar installers that I can trust? So providing community engagement opportunities where you're bringing resources to folks um, is going to make things a whole lot easier. And then ultimately offering incentives. Um, there are many examples, um, and we're going to talk about a few of um nonprofits working with local solar installers, whereby there's a donation to the nonprofit as well as a discount to the homeowner for folks who are going solar. Um, and of course, you know, financial incentives um, are often a really good motivator. So um, I'm just going to tell a few stories here about um, highlighting each of these um, five suggested active interactions. Um, and again, look forward to um, diving into uh, Q&A after this. Um, so this is a quote from one of our projects that we built in New Mexico for uh, the St. Thomas of Canterbury Episcopal Church. Um, and, you know, as they were describing uh, their reasoning for going solar, they talked about being faithful stewards of the creation. 
they wanted to serve as a visible witness to the surrounding community of our commitment to sustainability. So you can see here that they're they're putting their values into their language uh, that their members of their congregation and people of their faith are going to resonate with. Uh, this is a picture of a ribbon cutting at um, the Sandy Springs uh, Quaker Meeting House in Maryland. Uh, one of our recent projects that we partnered with Montgomery County Green Bank on, um, and they put it in their language. They're saying, you know, not only is solar good for the environment, but it's going to allow us to continue funding the causes we believe in, such as social justice, poverty elimination, justice reform, and peace efforts. So again, that's the, that's what's valuable to them, to their community members, and so that's how they're tying solar energy to having that bigger impact. Um, another example is um, the uh, Plumas Charter School in Quincy, uh, California, uh, that we partnered with Grid Alternatives on. Um, the way that the executive director of the school put it, you know, one of the core values of Plumas Charter School is respect. And having solar and sustainable energy ties very well with this core value of respect for our planet. So again, these are just a few examples of using that language of shared values to get people of your community to, to see from the perspective of the nonprofit why solar is so important. Uh, so now I'm gonna shift to tell a few stories about um, building on trusted relationships. Um, so this is a project that we built in East Oakland, California for Faith Baptist Church. Faith Baptist is an incredible organization that um, provides, uh, they serve as a food distribution center for a local food bank. They provide over 100 tons of food uh, to residents of East Oakland every year. And this was the ribbon cutting uh, for Faith Baptist. They actually, uh, and this is a good strategy as well, they they paired the ribbon cutting with an event that they were already having. It was uh, their 40th uh, anniversary as being a church. So the place was packed, um, you know, there, it was standing room only in the church. And of course, there was lots of excitement and celebration about the solar energy. And lo and behold, um, this gentleman, uh, David, uh, Deacon David Green, uh, came up to me right there in the ribbon cutting and gave me his business card and said, hey, I love what this uh, is doing to Faith Baptist. We want to bring solar to our church, uh, which is True Fellowship Baptist Church in Richmond, uh, just up the road from Oakland. Um, and so thankfully, in just a few months, we were able to then install solar on Faith Baptist Church. Um, and another uh, point here about storytelling, we were uh, fortunate enough to uh, get Bill McKibben to uh, tweet out about this project. And again, he, uh, with his uh, massive following, was able to amplify the story of this church uh, in Richmond, right behind the Chevron oil refinery, um, you know, being an example of the just transition to clean energy. Uh, another example of this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, nonprofits influencing other nonprofits to go solar, um, this is in South Carolina, our Coastal Carolina uh, Solar Ambassador Team, our college fellows at, at Coastal Carolina, um, a few years back in, uh, helped to bring solar to the first VFW in South Carolina, uh, VFW post 10804. Um, and they were able to do a social media campaign and make a video and get the story in the news. And they got people really excited about it. And lo and behold, the VFW in the next town over said, hey, wait a minute, we want to do that too. So VFW post uh, 10420 then went solar with us uh, the very next year. Uh, so to, to switch now to talk about um, storytelling, uh, again, social media, making videos, writing press releases and media advisories, ultimately getting the story in the newspaper and, and if possible on TV is going to be um, is going to be such a massive active interaction, right? You're going to be reaching that many more people. Not only do they see it when they're walking by, but now they hear people talking about it and it makes them feel like this is something that I can see in my community and something that I want to be a part of. So um, this was, again, uh, Faith Baptist Church, Pastor Curtis Robinson uh, was featured on CBS News uh, talking about the solar plus storage system that was installed there um, and how they had gotten an award from the U.S. Green Building Council for being the first resiliency hub in Oakland. Um, and of course, you can imagine that when that's on the TV news, um, how many people that might influence. 
So next, I want to talk about community engagement um, and incentives. So this was a project uh, that we did in East Oakland, in, uh, in, in the East Bay as well, um, in Piedmont, California. This was the Kahila Community Synagogue. And uh, both before and after uh, we installed solar at Kahila, we hosted these solar education events. So People would come on a weekday evening to the congregation, to the synagogue. We would meet in the basement and we would have an event to talk about solar for residential customers. And we would answer questions. And you can see the gentleman uh, on the right hand side of this picture wearing the orange shirt. He was a representative from a local solar company uh, that was a Sungevity at the time. And he was there to make a presentation to explain to residents how they could sign up for solar, how it would save them money on their electricity bills. And we also offered a incentive through that program, that the, the program that Sungevity pioneered called Steeple to People, right? Working with houses of worship to um, engage their congregants. And they offered a $750 discount to the residents that would go solar during a certain time period after Kahila did. And they would offer a $750 donation back to Kahila for people who uh, went solar. So all of a sudden you can imagine if you were a resident that was interested in solar, now your house of worship has is gone solar and you're offered, you know, oh, I can save some additional money by going solar and I can have an impact on the congregation by having this donation go back to them. That's a pretty powerful combination. Um, uh, this week actually in Atlanta, uh, Revolve is installing solar on the largest animal shelter in Georgia named uh, Lifeline Animal Shelter. Um, and we are actually uh, pioneering a, a, a similar incentive program with a local uh, nonprofit CDFI solar lender uh, in Georgia that is offering a residential solar lease program for low-income uh, families in Georgia. So as we finish this install over the next two weeks, uh, we're gonna be having a ribbon cutting at the end of March. Um, and at that ribbon cutting, we're gonna be bringing this uh, CDFI lender um, so that uh, we're gonna have a solar, uh, a solar themed adoption day for animals. So families from the animal shelter uh, community will be coming out to adopt animals and we'll have some solar themed uh, activities. And we're also gonna have that lender there so that they can connect and let people know if you go solar now, we're gonna make a donation. A percentage of every project is gonna go back to Lifeline. And there are plenty of uh, examples of this. One of the more notable ones is a, is a company, a nonprofit called Smart Power. Uh, Smart Power has been working for over a decade to run what they call solarized campaigns, where they work with cities, counties, companies uh, to engage their residents and employees to go solar at once um, with, with these types of incentive structures. So there's a lot of you know, as, as Eric uh, and the team pointed out earlier, there's a lot of research that can be done about these mechanisms and how they can be amplified. Um, but these are some of the examples and takeaways uh, that we've seen over the years. So um, yeah, here's our contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. Happy to discuss this uh, and more. And um, I'll pass it uh, back to you, Eric. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, your time. Great, thanks. Uh... See if I can get my screen sharing back up. Uh, okay, so we have lots of time for QA, which is great. Uh, flashing up here, uh, just some contact info, additional resources. There's the link to the full paper. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of the data behind the paper is available in some shape or form. So a few other useful links there. Uh, and with that, I think, uh, Issa, you're going to DJ the Q&A. Yes. Um, so thank you for all the wonderful questions that have come in. Um, I think we'll start with a couple that have um, surrounded like correlation versus causation. So Eric, would you be able to dive into unpacking the methods a bit more and what are we testing here? Yes. So I, in in presentations in general, I tend to cruise through methods because it gets sticky fast. I think in this case, maybe I, I cruise too quickly. Uh, so I'm showing, you can see the paper now, right? In the screen? Okay. Uh, so here's the actual paper itself. And as I mentioned, 
Uh, this one was pretty complex. We do a lot of complex work, obviously, at the lab. This one is especially so. The reason is, is that in peer influence, what you there's ways to separate causation from correlation. So earlier, I, I mentioned the goal here is to find a statistical association between non-residential installs and residential adoptions. And then under a handful of assumptions, that equates to causation. We discussed that here, uh, but I want to hit on, on two specific points. Uh, first, we use the difference in differences. For those familiar with differences and differences, the key assumption is that the treatment and control groups are similar in the trend. So the residential adoption is going the same direction in those two. Uh, we do a lot of tests to show how much that holds up. And we also do something called a bounding difference in differences where essentially we say, well, even if the pre-trend doesn't hold up, like how much could that affect the result? So that's one reason we think that it is causal. The second, someone asked about controlling for other factors, what else could be going on? So that comes in when we do, when we identify the treatment and control groups. So to do that, we have, as I mentioned, a bunch of zip codes that have non-resident installs. And we define some way to match those to zip codes that don't have non-residential installs. We do that through something called propensity score matching, essentially controlling for all the factors here up on the screen. So trying to find a treatment group that resembles as much as possible the control group by controlling for cumulative adoptions, PV hosting capacity, population, electricity rates, homeownership, household income levels, et cetera. So controlling for some socio-demographic factors, controlling for some PV market factors. At the end of that process, what we essentially have is a treatment group and a control group that we can defensively argue uh, are similar except for the non-residential uh, installation. So that's how we get to uh, arguing for causation. You know, the, the discussion of correlation versus causation, um, it's perpetual. It's something we're always thinking about. Uh, essentially, what we do is, is try our best to create models that are causal. Uh, in this case, uh, we do a lot of robustness checks. We come at this from a bunch of angles. Um, so those asking those questions, I definitely encourage you to read into the paper uh, and, and come back at me if you have further thoughts. Um, wonderful. Um, I think uh, there's another uh, set of questions that kind of builds off of that. So if we controlled for demographics, uh, can we see any regional trends um, or are those accounted for through the controlling? Uh, we did not do anything about regional trends. Um, but yes, to some extent that is controlled away because we want to essentially find zip codes that are like the other ones. Uh, so a lot of these, so just as an example, the data is always dominated by California in both the treatment and control group. So uh, to see regional differences, we'd have to essentially say, well, are there differences? <laughs> this is a lot of differences. Would there be differences in the differences in the differences between different regions? Um, which is a separate question we didn't do. Great. Um, and maybe one more question for you, Eric, and then we'll um, flip to some questions for Andreas. Um, what is the magnitude of these uh, influences? Can you put a number to it? Yeah, so uh, this is another complexity of this new approach that we did. The number is, it's kind of harder. Well, for that matter, all social influence is kind of weird, like numerically odd, if you go to other peer studies. So it's not just this one. But uh, to boil it down, the simple high level number would be roughly every non-residential residential installation is associated with three to five additional residential adoptions per quarter. Uh, you There's some time horizon on that. So as I mentioned, if you can imagine in the first year, say three to four additional adoptions per quarter, 
that's something like 12 additional residential adoptions that are somehow associated with the original non-residential installation. Uh, if you go out further enough in time, that non-residential system continues influencing systems but at some point, the chain of causation kind of crumbles. You know, if, if the business inspires one household to adopt, who inspires a neighbor to adopt, who inspires 10 other neighbors to adopt, at some point, the, the, the chain linking it back to the initial influence event uh, becomes a, a bit too stretched. But three to five additional adoptions per quarter for a few years is kind of the number. Great. Thanks. Um... And on to Andreas, there's several groups um, in the chat that are working with face space groups um, for solar. And um, I guess both, while this uh, presentation is kind of two parts, we um, have the paper that's uh, open source. Andreas, do you have, um, how can people get in touch with you and revolve in your presentation? Oh, sure. Well, I think, yeah, we'll, I think we're going to be sharing out the slides um, afterwards, uh, as Galen mentioned. Um, and of course, you know, our contact information, if you go to our website, revolve.org, um, re-volv.org, and then my contact uh, information, my email is there up on the screen. Um, yeah, there's a simple intake form on our website for folks that are interested in finding out about how to go solar at their house of worship or nonprofit on our website. Um, and then, of course, yeah, we've um, you know been working with our partners, Interfaith Power and Light, and Green the Church, um, who um, you know can also uh, provide additional um, uh, information or resources or um, guidance around going solar. Um, so yeah, we're happy to happy to talk with folks. And obviously, this is uh, you know this is our goal to to help as many folks as possible um, get their solar goals achieved. Uh, great. Um, then, uh, another question for you. So, um, are you, does Revolve just do solar or does Revolve work with storage as well? Yeah, great question. So, um, for most of our existence, it was just solar. Um, last year we've started for the first time offering solar plus storage loans. Uh, and in fact, as soon as we offered that, almost all of our projects um, since have been uh, loans for solar plus storage. Uh, so we're very excited to be offering storage. Obviously, as we know now, I mean, right now in California, um, due to the storms this week, we've had uh you know, 800,000 people are without power. And we know that houses of worship in particular and nonprofits generally tend to be places where people turn to during the times of crisis, whether that's a power outage from a storm or an earthquake or a wildfire. Um, so in fact, yeah, one of the um, pictures that I showed there was uh, Pastor Curtis Robinson, um, you know, showing off his uh, storage system at Faith Baptist. So that was actually, you know, after our initial solar installation, Interfaith Power and Light uh, brought that storage system uh, to Faith Baptist, and, and Faith Baptist is now uh, a resiliency hub in, in East Oakland. Um, but of course, you know, it doesn't stop there, right? There's a, There are a number of things that you can do um, to add resilience. So adding... Um, air filters, you know, adding various uh, supplies and resources, but also making sure that the nonprofit or the house of worship has the the staff and a plan in place such that when um, something were to happen, a disaster were to happen, that there's a volunteer or an employee who's going to open up the church on that day to make sure community members can get there. And then also the factor of how do you engage the community so that they know when my power goes out or when there's an issue that I'm going to Faith Baptist. Um, so these are things that groups like Interfaith Power and Light and others um, and ourselves are working on. Um, definitely something that I think the, the, the whole country is really going to be paying a lot more attention to um, given the increased uh, sporadic weather that we're having. Uh, thanks, Andreas. And I know that uh, new policies in California have made um, the use of storage alongside solar even uh, more interesting. So um, we'll likely see more of that to come. Um, and I think for our next question, we'll uh, go back to Eric. Um, and in the paper, do you think you could um, break down how the different types of commercial and government buildings had showed different influences? Um, 
Yeah, so this comes back to some points I made early on uh, that with this and really all social influence, well, the vast majority of social influence research, we're not, we don't know anything about the mechanism. We don't know if it's visibility or active interaction or, or whatever it is. So all we can do is see are there numeric differences across the building types. Um, and then the second challenge is that there are differences in sample size. So there are far fewer schools and houses of worship than there are commercial and government buildings. All of that said, uh, we do see some suggestive evidence that, for instance, government systems installed in government buildings tend to be particularly influential. Um, that's what the numbers suggest. And then theory would suggest that schools and houses of worship should be particularly influential for uh, some of the reasons that Andreas discussed that there's just certain institutions that have these direct relationships with communities. Um, we That was really kind of what motivated the, the work early on and uh, it'd be nice to dig further into that. But so I guess the quick answer to the question is in the paper, we explore that a bit. Uh, both in terms of comparing numeric results, but also speculating on um, kind of the additional mechanisms by institutions like houses of worship. And I know you've done other work, um, research on residential to residential influences. Um, how do these results compare? Uh, I believe there's a great uh, image in the presentation on that. Um, well, the... The results uh, are hard to compare because the models are, are much, much different. Um, and so we that's why in the paper, we tried to come up with some way to compare the way that we are doing it to residential. Uh, and the conclusion we come to is that based on that kind of heuristic approach, it seems that the adoption, the magnitude of influence is comparable. But yeah, we've we've done this, like I said, there's lots of research on social influence and there's lots of research on influence in solar. Uh, some of it is done by us. So there's, there's a whole other, there's lots of other work to dig into if anyone's curious on this. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I, I think um, from here, uh, we'll go back to Andreas um, from less a, um, a correlation exercise to a, um, what have you seen as ways to positively influence um, impressions of solar and adoption, some of which you've highlighted. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we tried to um, kind of highlight a few of those uh ideas in, in the presentation, but I, I think ultimately it boils down to, you know, when, you know, if you're a member of a congregation or, a, you know, a parent at, at a school, uh, you know, if the, the organization that you trust and are a, a part of, if, if, if the pastor of your church, for example, gets up and says, um, hey, we've gone solar, we're saving money, we are going to use that money to give back to the community. And this is a part of our values. This is a part of who we are as a community. Um, that is going to change hearts and minds. It's going to get people excited about solar that they now feel that it's not just something that they've heard about or maybe they've seen in the news, but now it's something in their community. And that's and, and then the storytelling around that, you know, so if we can do active social media campaigns, community engagement events, make a video, you know, get that story in the news when people see it and they see, oh, wait, this is in my community. This is my nonprofit, my kid's school, um, the animal shelter where I volunteer. Um, all of a sudden they become personally tied and connected to solar, whereas before they didn't have that. And that's ultimately our job is to connect the dots of, you know, how can solar benefit um, everyone and, and make sure that this is something they see in their community. It's not just, um, you know, something that they've seen somewhere else. Um, and the more, you know, as, as the research pointed out, you know, this can be used to seed new markets, can seed uh, solar in low income communities, can seed in communities of color. So I think that's our job, you know, as you know, we're a nonprofit ourselves. So our job is how can we bring solar to those places where it's not that common and hopefully get that get that seeding effect started, get that contagious effect started. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all about making the biggest splash that you can. Um, and, um, and, you know, we've had some ideas about how to do that, but of course there are a lot of groups working on this in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time and it's, and, and it's a really important research that's, you know, being presented here in this paper, right? I mean, when it comes to the climate crisis, we have to accelerate clean energy adoption as quickly as possible. And this seeding effect is like, uh, it's a very special tool in our tool belt that we can use um, to amplify solar adoption at the community level. Great. And um, for our final question, um, I'll think I'll let all of us answer it and I'll go first. So uh, what are the next steps or uh, what other topics are you exploring around the benefits of seeding? Um, I think I am uh, most excited for uh, more collaborations like this. It's not often that you see academic research alongside community um, CBOs working in this space. Uh, and that's a really great part of SIGN. Um, I'm also excited for the publications that will be coming out shortly. Um, this paper, but also our uh, end of round publications from all of our community groups mentioned in the beginning from SIGN. Um, those are available on the SIGN website. Um, uh, and I just want to address that some people had issues with the MailChimp link, um, but the it should be fixed now. And um, so please sign up for uh, the sign listserv um, at the bottom of the sign website. So um, maybe I'll go to Eric. What's what's next? Well, I don't know that uh, we at the Berkeley Lab have any next steps following up on this research, uh, but I, I will just second what you just said. It's been great to collaborate a bit and hear Andreas's points that uh, you know, a lot of the research we do, we, we kind of put it out into the world and, and present it, and um, it's, it's great to see how it could be potentially applied and hear some excitement around the implications, the results. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if we do end up with some next steps for research, uh, especially if there's a strong interest in this. Any last thoughts, Andreas? And then Galen, we'll end with you. Yeah, just that. I loved, yeah, um, in the paper and, and what you're just saying now, Eric, about, you know, how there's a lot more research that could be done about, you know, what are those direct interactions that lead to the highest adoption rates? And of course, you know, we've been experimenting with different strategies and community engagement uh, programs over the years. But of course, something that, you know, we're going to be trying to do more of is how do you really identify which of those active interactions have the biggest impact? Um, and then, of course, seeing what the researchers, uh, you know, are telling folks as well. Um, I do think that over the next couple of years, this is going to be increasingly important. So, yeah, thanks. All right. Thank, thanks all. Uh, I can close things out here. I'll, I'll, I'll mention one area that I think we could uh, spend a little bit more time researching on. And, and this really just kind of echoes some of what we've heard already, which is uh, doing research just to better understand the actual mechanics of this seeding effect. Um, as Eric discussed, I mean, we, we observe this aggregate effect of social influence, but that, that aggregate effect is, is certainly an amalgam of a lot of underlying things happening. And so research to kind of unpack what are those underlying elements of this social influence and, and how can we kind of pull those levers more effectively and more efficiently. So I think that's an area where um, there's an opportunity both you know for research and for just kind of practical experimentation um, and, and hopefully some combination of the two. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close things out. I want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar. Hopefully, uh, this was a good use of your hour. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the webinar uh, is re uh, was recorded. Uh, we will post a recording on the web, uh, and we'll send out an email in the coming days just letting you know where, where you can find that along with the, the slide deck. Uh, so thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you all in the next